Just um, once again in, in awe of the ways in which you've revealed yourself to us. Lord, we're reminded this morning even of the tremendous blessing it is that you, the living God, have allowed yourself to be made known through the living word. And so we ask, Father, that by your Holy Spirit you would illuminate our understanding, allow us to peer once more into your word, even to the point of pondering words. And Lord, that we would each be blessed and each be brought to a, an understanding of how you have prepared blessing for us and have extended us into the world in which we live, the communities in which we uh, negotiate life to be a blessing. The Father, we ask for your creativity just to be made known this morning and your word would come alive to us once more and we would leave here with just a greater appreciation of you and this privilege you've given us to know and understand you through the living word. These things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, first of all, Marilyn and I just want to extend a, a huge thanks to you and um, just to say over the last several years God indeed uses people all around the world to accomplish his will, to accomplish his desire and he does it in interesting ways. Um, like I said a little bit earlier, seems like our ministry has been one of filling holes. And, and it goes a little bit like this in that we started out serving Wycliffe Associates and in construction, as you saw a little bit earlier, just supervising different projects. As the years went by, Wycliffe Associates began to, un began to see that there were parts of the world in which some language groups were being um, not left out necessarily in, a, in getting a translation, but they were of low priority. In other words, they were multilingual people. There were pastors and leaders in these areas that well understood a, native, a, a gateway language or a trade language, and they could then take the word of God to their communities and speak in their own mother tongue and speak out the word of God. So Wycliffe Associates saw this as a challenge in order to see that these, these groups too had the word of God in their mother tongue. And so they shifted it their direction in what God was doing there to fill a hole that was needed. So that then brought before Marilyn and I another opportunity. And where are we going to serve to fill that hole? Where, where I ended up was initially writing content for an exegetical commentary, and it was, it's for the pastors, so that as they walk through their own uh, study of the scripture, how to take the, the, the various phrases, the various concepts, uh, and get them into their own mother tongue languages. Within a year of that time, I became an editor, one of three editors for a team of 12 who are writing uh, biblical exegetical commentary. So this morning, I'm hoping to blend not only how we approach exegetical commentary, but how can that be made into a Oh, a, a, a message that can be applicable to us here in the church, um, here in the, in the good old U.S. And so I want to just take a, 
a look at that this morning as we explore. If you'd open up your Bibles to Matthew 5, we're going to take a look at this passage here, 13 through 16. It's been mentioned a few times this morning already. But it says here, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may, be, they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. The word of the Lord. So what we have here, um, if I was to approach this exegetically, I immediately run up against this, this problem for indigenous folks, some of whom do not use metaphor in their language. So right away we're confronted with two words, salt and light both of which are metaphors, and yet in our language we, we understand them fairly quickly, and the context helps us out a lot. But that words cannot be just given a, a root form and said, this, is, this word is always going to mean this no matter what. But there are societies, there are cultures in which that happens. One word means one thing. So as we write commentary, we're confronted with that dilemma. So for an example, the word key, oftentimes I may see in a, in a commentary that somebody's putting together, this is a key point. Well, in English, key has a, a real wide semantic range. Key can mean uh, uh, something you unlock something with, as a noun. Key can be, uh, oh, that's the key piece to a puzzle. It's a solution. A key could be the delete button on your keyboard. A key could be, oh, one of the devices on the piano that strikes a hammer, that strikes a, key, strikes a string and produces a tone. And yet it also could be used as an adjective and used to say this is the primary or the main thrust of this discussion. So key, it's a pretty easy example. We run across the word salt. And it too has a semantic range. But we're going to, the, from the context, we're going to take a look at salt and look at it from two different ideas. Well, what is, what is Jesus in the book of Matthew calling us as not only the church, the corporate church, but us as individuals of the church? What is he calling us to do and how is he calling us to respond in view of the fact that we are salt? So let's just take a look at the corporate church first and see if I have this on. So God has called individual members, or individual members of his church. Oh, I'm, I'm one slide ahead. Here we go. God has called his church to be salt. That is, we're preservers of the truth. Why is that important? I'm going to take a look at several passages of Scripture, so if you want to follow along, this would be great. Second Timothy will we'll camp out there a little bit. So Paul is... <clears throat> at the point in his life where he's preparing Timothy to take over the ministry and he leaves Timothy with some probably more but at least three pretty significant instructions that drive the whole book of 2 Timothy and in chapter 1 verse 13 and 14, he says these two things. What you've heard from me, keep 
as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. And secondly, he says, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And so what we have is Paul telling Timothy, you are a preserver of that which is God, God has given me and now I'm passing on to you. You are a preserver of the truth. Hold to that pattern of sound words. Keep it, guard it, he says. Then in chapter two, he goes on and says this in verse one and two. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. And the implication in there from Paul to Timothy is that you're going to entrust men who are going to be able to entrust men, who are going to be able to entrust men. And eventually that's going to get down to us as individuals, isn't it? Who are going to be faced with preserving that which God has given us, his message of unconditional love, grace, mercy. And we see that pictured in the cross. And, and it, it is God's, the, the full weight of God's justice being poured out on the cross on Christ Jesus as he allows himself to go to the cross. We see the full weight of his righteousness being taken care of on the shoulders of Christ and by which he imputed to us that same righteousness. And, and so we get, the, we get the, the full weight of the meaning behind I, I cling to the old rugged cross. So Matthew says, you are the salt of the earth. You are a preserver of the truth. If the salt loses its saltiness, what good is it? Well, the question has to be asked, how does salt lose its saltiness? <clears throat> well, in, in a real life, if I, if I had pure sodium chloride and, and watered it down, we might see it dissolve, but as soon as the water evaporates, the salt crystals remain. But if it's just salt that's attached to another mineral, another rock, the water washes it away, it's what's left is this rock which has no value. Well, how does the salt within us lose its saltiness? And sometimes we use clever arguments, whereas we're called to cling to the cross, we're called to be preservers of the truth. We, it, through good intention, we say the world has need to know of Christ, and that is true, and so we reach. Rather than proclaiming the truth, we reach, and the world, what does it do in response? It steps away, because this word of the cross is foolishness to them. They step away, and so, driven by a desire to somehow reach the world, we step with them. In doing so, well, we're kind of here with the cross. The world steps away, and we go along with them. After a while, I'm, I'm barely scratching at the surface of the cross, and the world looks at me and says, why should I be a Christian? You don't really look any different than anybody else, because I've left. I, I'm no longer clinging to this and proclaiming it as the message from God to a world that is lost. So why, why are we doing this? The corporate body of believers, Paul tells Timothy, guard this. Preserve it. Maintain, retain the standard of sound words and teach others to do so. And he tells them the reason why. There's two main reasons. In chapter 3, he says this, and this kind of is going to show the picture of the world as it con 
continues to step away from the righteousness of God. So in chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 of 2 Timothy, you have, Mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. So the corporate body, and we see it, the world is continuing to step away from the message of the cross. The things that stand for the holiness of God, they're stepping away from that. It was there in the days of Paul, and it's more visible to us perhaps in, in our day. The second and probably even more disturbing part is in chapter 4 in 2 Timothy. And he says this, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, this is verse 1, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to, to say what their itching ears want to hear. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. So this is specific instruction from Paul to Timothy, but because of the charge to Timothy in chapter 2 to teach others who are going to teach others who are going to teach others, this instruction comes down to us as the church to maintain this and understand. And this is, this is the hard part, to know that beforehand God has told us there will be those even who come through the doors into the congregation who will eventually look for teachers that do nothing but just tickle their ears, say what they want to hear. And he tells Timothy, in view of that, keep your head. What's he saying? He's going back to chapter 1. Retain that standard of sound words. Guard the treasure that's been entrusted to you. So one aspect of being salt for the corporate church is to preserve the truth, maintain it, guard it, preach it in season, out of season, always being ready. But what about us as individuals? As an individual, We'll see later in, in Mark 9 that he tells us to have salt in ourselves. Well, what does that mean? And, and I think maybe for this, this morning, I'll just use the phrase to cultivate a desire for the truth. But what am I meaning? What I want to express is that we cultivate a desire for the truth that outweighs every other human desire. And I'm going to just use one little passage real quick. It's a passage you're all very familiar with. It's in the book of James. James chapter 1, the first, uh, well, 2 through 5. And we know this passage, and we, we read this passage, and we, eat, we look at this passage and say, you know, James... James was either by this time just a, a little bit off because he tells us to consider it joy when we encounter struggle, trial, temptation. So James was either a little bit, I don't know, maybe a little miffed about it, or he knew something. Or he knew something. And his desire for the truth pushed him to be able to pen these words. And here's what he's saying. 
starting in verse 2 in James. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lack wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to him. So we're confronted with the truth of these words. We're confronted with this idea that struggle, temptation, trials produce within us they're designed to produce endurance. When we come into agreement with God and say, okay, endurance, when it has its perfect work, is completing something in me that is lacking. When I can come to grips with that and agree with what God is doing through this thing we call struggle or temptation or trial, and I understand that what he's doing is perfecting something or completing something in me that's lacking, I can say, I can actually change a question. I can change the question from, why, why is this happening, God? Why am I going through this? I can change the question, what do you want me to know, Father? What is it that you want me to know? And in verse 5, isn't that exactly what he says? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God. We can ask the Father, what is it that lacking in me that you're allowing this particular struggle to produce endurance in, in me so that I might be made complete? We get to change the question. And what that starts to do, this is just one example, but what it starts to do is to cultivate within us a desire to know God beyond the immediate struggle. James says, count it pure joy. It's the picture of Christ we see in Hebrews 12, facing the cross, and for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. So it wasn't that he got locked up in the immediate circumstance. He saw the deliverance of the Father past the, the immediate circumstance. In the same way, James is encouraging us as individuals within the corporate body because we individually experience struggle to individually cultivate that desire, that affection for his ways and his word it builds our trust, and that's what he's desiring to do. We're going to move, shift a little bit now into what it is to be the light. And so, corporately, God has called his church to be light. And in this context of Matthew 5, light is, is seen as proclaimers of the gospel proclaimers of God's truth, the whole gospel. This ministry was prophesied way back in the days of Isaiah. The gospel that would eventually make its way to the nations, to the Gentile nations. So we're just going to look at a couple passages where this has been prophesied. And in, in Isaiah chapter 42, we'll look at a couple verses here, verses 6 and 7. It says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you, and I'll make you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. And then later in chapter 49, verse 
Isaiah writes these words. It is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. A prophetic word given in the days of Isaiah that would reach forward into a new covenant era in which Christ, because of the cross, because of his resurrection, makes possible the forming of the church, the, fo the bringing together of both believing Jew and believing Gentile into this one new entity called the church. And then we're given the responsibility to proclaim that message of truth, that message of hope. If you look over in Ephesians, Paul reminds us, he tells us of that purpose for which God even called him as an apostle and calls the other apostles. So in Ephesians 3, beginning at verse 7, he says this, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the rest of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain or bring to the light, other translations say, to everyone the administration of this mystery which for ages was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus the Lord. We know from the very beginning in the book of Ephesians that Paul tells us that God had chosen us from before the foundation of the world, that is his church, that we might be made holy and blameless. So this was, this was not just a new idea for God as time unfolded. God had designed it this way from before the foundations of the world. And even Paul, the timing in which he would be born and raised, confronted on the road to Damascus, and then given this ministry to bring the fullness of the message of the gospel to its fruition. And then we see that, and we see that Paul tells us this was made known not only to them, but is now given over to the church to continue moving forward. Well, what about us as individuals? So we're called as individuals within that church to walk in the light as he himself is in the light. We know from John, the writer of the Gospel of John, Jesus makes a statement, I am the light. I am the light. And then he encourages us to walk in the light. We looked at this passage a little bit earlier, and it's always good to read things a couple of times. Um, so we're going to go back over to Ephesians 5. We read 8 through 14 earlier today. We'll go ahead and read 8 through 20 from Ephesians 5. You were once darkness, but now you're light in the world. Live as children of light. The fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the, will, the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you can see, there's, there's a similar theme running through this that we saw from Paul to young Timothy. Difficult times were going to come. You, however, on the other hand, be prepared. We see a similar message. Be careful then how you're walking. Not as unwise, but as wise. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Because the days are evil. He says that. So that as individuals, we wrestle with this concept then. So what does it mean to walk in the light? Well, we've seen a couple ideas here. But I want to suggest something here. If we go back over to another real familiar passage, Ephesians 2. And we talked earlier about under the idea of salt. How do I cultivate a desire for God that outweighs every other desire? And we looked at the passage in James to help us understand that even struggle is designed to mature us. When I know that, I can pursue it. And I can say, yes, I understand, Lord, what's going on now. What do you want me to know? Here's another possibility. So Ephesians chapter 2. These are going to be real familiar verses to us all. As for you, I'm going to read 1 through 10. And then ask us to consider verse 10 a bit. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the desires of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But God, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus. In order that, here's God's unfolding now, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This phrase, many, many of you have purchased a piece of furniture and you know somebody's behind the crafting of that furniture somebody's behind all the the joinery that it takes to fit things together and then the the router work that it takes to to design a, a nice molding and we can appreciate that and we can appreciate the craftsman that is behind that creation God here says here you you are his workmanship. You can almost hear the Father say, you're just the way I wanted you to be. I've made you just the way I wanted you to be. Look at you. And I'm creating you to do good works. And then we have to ask ourselves, well, what are these good works? You know, God, from the very, very beginning, we see it in Romans 1, it unfolds. His nature, his character is seen in, in creation. His nature and character are seen in how he demonstrated to us mercy, compassion, grace, forgiveness. Could it be, could it be that God, in designing us, fashioning us just the way he wanted us to be, made us vessels. And those good works are to show compassion, forgiveness, mercy, grace, 
extending love, being people who are lovers of the truth, people who cling to the cross and the truth of the message of the cross. I, I, I just ask that just because of this. God has promised in Romans 8, 29, one of his purposes is that he's going to conform us to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. We are in process. We are now, at this very moment, being conformed into the image of his son. And here's, we're gonna, I'm going to finish with this. Here's a little something in the book of Hebrews that he tells us about Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1, verse 2. In these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. And then verse 3. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Could it be, could it be that because God is committed to conforming us as individual members of his body and the corporate body into the image of Jesus Christ, could it be that one of the things he has designed within us as we pursue demonstrating his mercy his forgiveness, his love, his compassion, we become lovers of the truth that he's actually designed within us to be many reflectors of the glory of God. We too, like Christ, are reflecting to the world the image and the glory of our Father who's in heaven. And what an, what an amazing, amazing thing he's called us to be when he says, you are salt, you are light, and we are blessed in order to extend blessing. Let's just pray. Father, when we, when we approach your word, we're taken, Lord, by the substance, the depth, the ways in which it speaks to us. Father, sometimes we're even caught up with the fact that we will run by a passage that we've read many times. And you delight us by speaking something new, opening our eyes to see that which we didn't see before. You give us more understanding you constantly reveal yourself to us through your word, the living word that you so graciously allowed and that the Reformation reminded us, your church, that you extended yourself that way. Make us people, Father, who will cling tenaciously to the message of the cross that we guard that treasure and that we're all about pouring it into the life of another who will pour it into the life of another. Father, make us people who cultivate a desire for you that goes beyond every other human desire. Lord, we are people in need of grace every day. And we are extremely grateful that you're completing the work that you began in us. 
that you are the one conforming us to the image of Christ. You are the one that is going to present us to yourself holy and blameless. We are ever grateful. In your name, amen.